artificial neuron model and linear regression. Now, in the last class, uh, we had uh, given you an introduction to the biological neurons, right? What we discussed there was uh, that uh, the human brain, okay, is able to do enormous amount of computations, okay, and in a very short time, utilizing the billions of uh, nerve cells, okay, or the neurons, okay, which are existing in our brain. And as I explained in the last class, that these neurons are interconnected to each other okay, in the form of a network, in fact a very complex network. I mean it is not that we understand fully about all the different uh, connection mechanisms of biological neural networks in a complete way. Okay. Whatever we know is mostly from the performed and uh, this is uh, mostly the scientists uh, observations and beliefs okay which uh, i mean has led to some kind of a model making for the biological neurons and essentially it is the biological neuron model which we will have to adapt okay in order to do the computations for our purpose so what we are considering is the artificial neuron model and the name artificial itself means that it is different from that of the biological neurons. Okay. The first thing is that uh, we in a typical artificial neural network uh, structure, we are not going to consider so many number of neurons. I mean it is only a small manageable number of neurons that we are going to consider. Okay that too for solving specific problems and as, as I told you that if I have to list out the uh, different applications of neural network then that list is never going to be complete because we can imagine the applications of neural networks in any application domain I mean be it science, be it technology, be it any type of uh, market forecasts weather forecasts, I mean many applications, okay, signal processing, biological applications where we can, I mean, apply the neural networks in a very big way and in fact, uh, I mean neural networks along with the fuzzy systems, okay, they are very popular, they are uh, going to be very popular for the, uh, I mean domestic appliance controls, okay. I think all of you must have heard about that, the neuro fuzzy controllers. So, there are large number of applications which uh, I mean one can think of. Now, coming to the model of the artificial neuron, okay, it needs uh, some introduction. Now, as I was discussing in the last class that uh, the biological neurons are interconnected to each other okay, through what is called as the synapse. Okay. So, I made a mention that it is the synapse which is basically uh, deciding about the strength of the connection, how strong or how weak those connections are. Typically a nerve cell or a neuron could be connected to several other neurons or it might be receiving inputs from several sources. So, if we look at a neuron in isolation, supposing this is a neuron that we are going to consider and there we are basically receiving inputs from a number of sources, right. So, there are plenty and I am just drawing a few, okay. This may be the input number 1, this may be the input number 2, input number 3 and so on. We may be having n such inputs. So, I just happen to number them from 1 to f uh, n, okay. And uh, they are connected to this neuron which is going to do the processing. Now, these neurons are connected to these ones using the synapses. Now, synapses are existing in the biological neural network as I explained, but a very similar concept we drew up for the artificial neurons also, okay, 
where we model the strength of the connections this way. So, we call the strengths of the connection as the synaptic weights. So, the strengths of the connections will be known as synaptic weights. Weights they decide that how much of strength it is. So, larger the value more strong the connections are, okay. smaller the values less strong they are. In fact, I mean there is no binding that whether the synaptic weights must be only positive or not. As a matter of fact, it could be positive as well as negative. Because even for biological neuron, uh, neurons also or biological, the, the, the synapses associated with the biological neurons which we discussed in the last class, we said that they could be either excitatory or could be inhibitory in nature. Now, uh, we will be having such synaptic weights which will be associated and those synaptic weights will be defined for the connection between the input and the neuron under consideration. Now, mind you the input may be received from other neurons also or the inputs may be coming directly from any of our perceptual units. Okay. So, no matter whatever the sources of the inputs are, basically we are receiving the inputs from some source and there are a large number of neurons existing and let us pick up a small, uh, I mean one particular neuron out of it and let us say that we index this particular neuron by the letter k. So, this is a particular neuron k that is under consideration and this is receiving a number of inputs and these are having connections or the synaptic weights which will be written as w k 1, w k 2, w k 3 and so on and this one will be w k n. Okay. So, the uh, notations that we are using is that w k g basically indicates the connection strength from the neuron g to the neuron k. I mean if you are considering all these inputs to be neurons, okay, which in typical cases it will be like that. Okay. So, w k j will indicate the connection, connection weight from neuron j to neuron k. So, please note this order, it is not k to j, I mean it is not uh, always the case that the connection which is existing as w k j will be equal to w j k. Okay. In fact, the feedback path may or may not be existing. So, the way we are indicating this does not mean that there is any connection between k and n back or k and 3 back. If there is a connection, okay, then we will be indicating that by a separate weight. For some applications, w k j may be equal to w j k, but k j always means connection from neuron j, the superscript that we are writing after and k, the superscript that we are writing before. So, k is this neuron. Now, when these sort of strengths are defined okay, and we can define the inputs as x 1, x 2, x 3 and so on up to x n. Okay. Now, we are linearly combining all these things. So, in effect what it means is that we are summing up all these inputs okay, multiplied by their appropriate weights. So, that the sum total okay, which we can uh, call as the u k, u k will be equal to summation of j equal to 1 to n w k j and this has to be multiplied by x j. So, it is summation of 
x j w k j and the summation will be from j 1 to j equal to 1 to n is this clear. So, we are adding up all this n different weighted inputs effectively linearly combining them together. Okay. Now, uh, to this we often require to I mean so this will give us some kind of an activation value okay, some kind of I mean weighted addition that we have made and we may like to move this whole thing up or down okay, I mean just like adding some DC offsets to it. Okay. I mean those who are familiar with the operational amplifiers they know that whenever we are combining some inputs okay, to the operational amplifier using it as a summer, we can add some DC also to it so that the whole summed input can be raised up or I mean if the DC is added in the negative direction the whole thing can be brought down. So, it is a offset or what we can call as a bias that can be applied. So, we can in fact say that this bias okay, that also will be used as an input to this system. So, this bias I can call as B k again the uh, subscripts k for u k and B k means that they are pertaining to the neuron k over here. Okay. So, that the combined uh, output of this will be V k equal to U k plus B k. So, it is the bias and with that we add up all these um, I mean weights, weight multiplied by this inputs. Okay. Now, the thing is that this is the V k and uh, we are interested in finding that what kind of a response is this neuron going to give us. Okay. That is very important, right. I mean basically to determine that only we have considered this artificial neuron model. All right. Now, uh, there are several ways whereby we can define this function and the simplest of that is to consider a threshold function. The threshold function can be defined like this that you see that the combined output from all this is what? This one V k equal to U k plus B k and U k is this summation and B k is the bias that we have added. Now, we can say that this uh, will result in the activation like this that if V k is equal to I mean is uh, supposing greater than or equal to 0, okay, then we can say that we are going to design the neural network or design this neuron in such a way that followed by this I mean if we take this output okay, and we just pass it through some uh, function let us say this is a function of V k okay, and this will be the overall output. So, we are going to define this function now as a threshold function. How? that if this V k that is the total response over here is greater than or equal to 0, then the final output okay, if we can uh, call this as Y k, okay, the final output of this. Okay, if V k is equal to 0 is greater than or equal to 0, we define that Y k is equal to 1 and y k is equal to 0 otherwise. Otherwise means that when v k is less than 0. That means to say what? That v k can assume any value in the range of I mean I mean could be a positive, could be a negative value 
and in this case we have not really put any binding on the value of v k, v k could mean anything I mean theoretically I should say it can go from minus infinity to plus infinity, but the output is hard limited ok, we call this as hard limit. So, the output is hard limited to 1 or 0 ok. So, if you plot the response of this threshold function that would look something like this that on this axis we plot v k and on this axis we plot y k. So, this necessarily means that at v k equal to 0 we are going to see a discontinuity in the function definitely. As long as v k is less than 0 ok, we are going to have the value of y k to be equal to 0. So, this is y k equal to 0 and this is the point where we are going to make the y k equal to 1 ok and this is the positive direction of v k. So, this is towards plus infinity and this direction is towards minus infinity. So, as long as it is less than 0 y k is equal to 0 and when v k is greater than or equal to 0 with a discontinuity happening at v k equal to 0 the y k is going to be equal to 1. So, this is a threshold function that one can use in which case the response of this neuron ok is going to be absolutely binary in nature right. Now, in this case we consider that the outputs are going to be 0 or 1 right, but there are uh, some applications where we do not require the binary values modeled as 0 and 1. We quite often need applications where the output is to be modeled as minus 1 or plus 1 ok. And if it is minus 1 or plus 1 in that case we have to define this function f to be a signum function ok. In that case we are going to define the threshold function like a signum function, signum of v k meaning what that if v k is greater than or equal to 0 then y k is going to be equal to plus 1. So, y k will be signum of v k meaning that v k greater than or equal to 0 y k is equal to plus 1 and with v k less than 0 y k is going to be minus 1 right. So, here the function would look very similar ok, it will be minus 1 up to here then a discontinuity at v k equal to 0 ok. So, this axis is v k as before, this is y k and beyond v k greater than 0 we are going to have y k equal to 1. So, this is the value of 1, this is the value of minus 1 almost the same thing as that of the threshold function. So, this is also a hard limiting only restricting the value to 0 and 1 or minus 1 and plus 1. In fact, this particular neuron model ok, where the response y k can be either 1 or 0 and it is defined as a threshold function like this. This neural models are known as McCulloch and Pitts neural network model. So, this was originally proposed by them. McCulloch and Pitts. So, this is often known as the McCulloch and Pitts neural network models ok. Now, it is not always mandatory that the neurons will behave in this manner only because after all the kind of problems that we are going to solve with the neural networks ok, there a uh, wide range of variations in their response is quite often needed. So, if we are living with the analog world like say for example, here we did not put any restriction on the values of this x 1 to x n. They are analog, they can vary in any manner you like and uh, 
the v k on the v k the, the, on the sum there also we did not put any restriction right. But we are only restricting the output, but why do we restrict it always we need not have to do that. So, what we can do is that we can propose a different model also. Now, for, for a very uh, simplistic model why do not we consider the linear model itself by linear model I mean to say that what is the problem if we do not choose any f function out here and we take this output directly that means to say that we make y k equal to v k. Okay. If we make that way then our uh, uh, model gets quite simplified in that case how will be the input output characteristics pretty simple because if we take a linear model if we take a linear model in that case we can plot it like this this axis v k and this axis y k. So, when v k is equal to 0 we will have y k equal to 0 and when v k is something let us say a value equal to a y k also will be having a value equal to a because we are going to have y k equal to v k only. So, that it will be a it will be a perfect straight line okay, with a slope of 45 degree and I mean passing through the origin it will be a perfect straight line. So, so that will be our perfect linear model for that. Okay. In fact, uh, just to represent the neural network in the form of a linear model, okay, we make uh, some simplification in its structure. You see so far we are taking the bias and the inputs separately. Okay. In fact, it is possible to include this bias okay, as a part of the uh, inputs only means that we can uh, I mean model it like this that you see here we have got the numbers ranging from x 1 to x n they are the inputs. So, we can have an input which we can call as x 0. Okay. So, x 0 and that will be connected to the neuron and then we can have the other inputs as it is that is to say x 1, x 2, x 3 and so on up to x n. This is x n all right and this weight we are going to call it as w k 0 okay. so that we have x naught w k naught to be equal to b k. So, what we are simply doing is that this b k rather than representing as a separate bias connection we are representing it in the form of an input only after all bias is also an input, but we are just modeling this way. So, w k 1 w uh, so this is w k 0 this is w k 1 this is w k 2 and this is w k n. So, that what happens is that when I write the expression for v k I can simply add it up like this x j w k j and in this case I sum it up from j is equal to 0 to n. Okay. So, that is the only difference I mean earlier I was calling j equal to 1 to n and then adding the bias to it in order to realize v k and in this case I am simply describing it by a single equation that summation x j y k j. Okay. Now, in this case actually the in, in a linear model okay, if it is a perfect linear model then we are not making any restriction about the values which v k and y k can assume because like before we are uh, taking the value of v k in the range of minus infinity to plus infinity. Okay. So, 
Likewise, y k also can be in the range of minus infinity to plus infinity, but quite often for practical consideration we tend to put some hard limiting threshold okay, beyond some range. So, if it is such that I mean from a practical realization point of view that this is the point beyond which our hardware cannot process the signal, okay, we can put a hard limiter out there. Okay. So, that between some range, I mean between this range, we can use it as a linear model. Okay. So, when we talk about a linear model, that necessarily means that within our expected range of operation, okay, it is going to follow a linear response. It is going to follow this equation, which I have just now mentioned, that is to say summation of v k is equal to summation of x j w k j and summation ranging from j is equal to 0 to n. Okay. Now, this is a linear model and let us try to see that what could be the application of that. Okay. Where are we going to use this, this kind of a linear model? Basically, we can use it for any data fitting where we have to fit a straight line to a given set of data. Maybe that we have conducted some experiment okay, and the experimental data is showing a large number of variations. Let us say that uh, this is the input. Okay. We have uh, noted some input output characteristics. So, that we have set some inputs and for those inputs, okay, there will be some output values. Maybe that when the input is this much, we have got output this. Maybe when the input is this, the output is this. Maybe for input this. So, like that, there could be a set of points that we can obtain. Okay. So, this may be the data that you have collected from any experiment can be a scientific experiment, can be any experiment that you would like to do. Let us say, let us take some very simple example. Supposing you are trying to uh, plot uh, the uh, weight of a person against the height. Okay. So, on this axis we have weight and on this axis we plot height. Now, it is uh, known that generally the persons having, I mean the persons who are taller, they tend to have more weight as compared to the persons who are short. Okay. Not always the case because, I mean the weight of a person is not dependent upon height alone. The weight in fact will be dependent upon so many factors, I mean his height, his basic physique. Okay then his uh, I mean food habits, okay, his calorie intake, fat intake, I mean his dietary habits, then also uh, how much of calories he burns, okay, how much of exercise he performs every day. On so many factors, the weight of a person will be dependent, but we are only studying that how is the weight changing with height. Okay. So, maybe that we conduct an experiment on 1000 people okay, and we make a plot like that, that uh, I mean uh, against height we plot the weight and this may be a set of data that we obtain. Right? Now, our objective may be to fit a curve, okay, fit a curve that passes best through these set of points. We do such kind of curve fittings in experiments, is not it? Now, whenever we are applying a linear model, we would necessarily fit in a straight line to this set of observations that we have made. Okay. Now, whenever we, we want to fit a straight line, then we have got two free choices for that straight line. What are the free choices? The intercept and the slope. right? A straight line will be 
characterized by the intercept and the slope. I mean if we are writing in the popular form of y is equal to m x plus c, m being the gradient okay, or the slope and c being the intercept, okay, then that is the way whereby we can model a straight line. And in fact, we got a free choice that we can vary m, we can vary c okay, in any manner we like. I mean that means to say that if we do not have any a priori guesswork available, okay, what we are going to do is to fit a try out with wide varieties of m and c and finally coming up with the best type of straight line fitting. Okay. We know that the best fit straight line would be somewhere over here. Okay, but somebody may like to fit the straight line like this, somebody may like to fit the straight line like this, in which cases we know that it is not an appropriate straight line fitting. Now, supposing that we have fitted a straight line, we have managed to fit a straight line like this, the best set of M and C we have chosen. Okay. From this set of experimental data. Now, there are some points okay, which are lying above the curve, there are some points which are lying below the curve. So, like that, I mean there are a large number of observations that we have made. Okay. And if you see, I mean if you take any particular point, like say for example, I take this, per, uh, this height. Okay. For this height, I have got this to be the difference or the error between the actual value, the actual value is this and the fitted value is this. So, this is an error, okay. whereas for this one the error is here. Okay. So, if I take this to be a positive error, this one is a negative error. Okay. Now, I have ways to make the error positive because if I take the absolute value of the error or if I take the square of the error okay, and if I add the square of the errors or the square of absolute errors, then I will get a combined error measure and if I divide it by the total number of points that I have used in the experiment, I will be getting the mean square error also, which is a measure that how good or how bad my curve fitting is. So, in this case also it is going to be a straight line fit that we are trying to do. Okay. And very interestingly, the equation that we are going to write for this is of the form of y is equal to m x plus c only. Only thing is that instead of writing it as y is equal to m x plus c, according to our notation, we will write it as y call it y k, okay, because again if we are processing this using the kth neuron, call it as y k, okay. y k will be equal to okay, w 1 x plus w 0. If I write it in this form, what does that mean? Then w 0 indicates the intercept and w 1 indicates the slope all right what is x x is the input x is the input to the system what is the input the height okay we are seeing the person's height and against that we are plotting the weight okay so x is the input to it and w1 can be defined as the synaptic weight between the input and the output okay now in this case that means to say that we will be having only two neurons right so it is the neuron 1 okay and it is the neuron 2 let's not call it as k anymore we have neuron 1 and neuron 2 and neuron 1 is connected to neuron 2 by the synaptic weight which we are now going to call it as w21 or 12 1 because it is wkj as we had said so, we are going to write it as W21 and this it is the neuron 2 which is doing the processing and here we are going to have an input equal to plus 1 and this will be multiplied by W0, not exactly W0, this is W20. Okay. 
so that the overall response that is y2 will be equal to w21 into here the input will be I mean although I have written it as 1, 1 is the neuron number, but its input will be x. So, it will be w21 into x plus w20. So, that the whole thing is modeled as a very simple neural network okay, whose response will be in this case y2, it is a linear response that is being made okay, and the input to this is x okay, multiplied by w21 the synaptic weight and w20 this indicates the bias. So, the bias in this case indicates the intercept. So, the bias stands for the intercept and w21 that is the synaptic weight that stands for the uh, slope. So, this is the slope and this is the intercept. So, we can, so that means to say that fitting a straight line to this set of data means that modeling it to a neural network. Because after all, what we have to determine? Just like the way to fit a straight line, we have to make a good choice of this M and C. Very similarly, we need to have a good choice of this W21 and W20. If we can make a good choice of W21 and W20, then the job is done. And what job is done? Like in this case, you see that if somebody gives me the height of some unknown person means this is the set of data that I have gathered during my experiment, during my trials I have gathered this data. So, now that I have got this data and I have fitted a straight line, if someone else's data is put in or if I know the height of somebody, okay, then I can easily use this curve in order to say that if it is given that okay the height is this much, then the corresponding weight will be this much. That is what we are going to say because this will be the weight that we are going to interpolate out of it. Okay. So, likewise here also uh, uh, what happens is that once the neural network is trained okay, with some patterns, with some inputs okay, and you feed some unknown input to this system. Okay. In that case, it will be behaving with whatever weights with which it has already trained. So, the neural network has already trained itself with some W21 and W20. That means to say that it has already fitted a straight line like this. So, now if we just feed some unknown input to it, then we will get the corresponding output which will be as per the fitted data. Correct? Well, I mean uh, uh, let us not uh, talk in terms of probability at this point. All that we are trying to say is that okay, this is the fitted data. So, I mean uh, because it is an unknown data to it, I mean we can at best conclude that we are going to have this particular point. Now, I mean how good or how bad that is with respect to the actual data that we are not knowing yet. Okay. So, it is after conducting a large number of experiment. In fact, to be very honest with you, this experiment is not at all a good experiment because as I was telling you that he, here I have assumed that the weight of a person is dependent on only one factor that is the height which is not at all true. It is dependent on many factors. So, in fact, if we now start listing the different factors to which it is uh, related to, in that case we are going to get different curves like if now for say for example, I uh, uh, pl uh, pl plot a curve as weight as plotted against the average calorie intake of a person. Okay. Then also I will get a separate curve out of that okay. or I mean 
all the parameters with which something is dependent upon, okay, if I plot all these together, then effectively I will not be getting a model like this, but for each one of the inputs, okay, I am going to get a uh, straight line fit of this sort of nature, so that ultimately it will be a combined fitting of linear response. Okay. In fact, I mean uh, yeah, it will be like this that supposing there is uh, some output, okay, let us say that uh, the output to this neuron is dependent upon this two set of data. Okay. So, I say that these are coming from the neuron 1 and the neuron 2 and supposing this is the neuron 3 whose response we are trying to find out and also there is a bias. So, that I say that this is plus 1. So, this is W 3 0, this is W 3 1, this is W 3 2 and then this one will be the Y 3. In this case what happens is that your Y 3 will be equal to W 3 0 that is to say the bias okay, plus W 3 1 we call it as x 1 plus W 3 2 we call this as x 2. Okay. So, this will be the combined output okay, so that we get. So, now that Y 3 is dependent upon two inputs Y 3 is a function of x 1 as well as x 2. So, we get two slopes pertaining to that one associated with x 1 and the other that is associated with x 2. So, this is a two dimensional problem now or rather modeled it as a two input network and like this we can extend. So, essentially it is a data fitting problem that we are doing and let me also tell you about uh, I mean it is not that always it will be a uh, linear curve fitting that we are going to do. Supposing the observed data is say of this pattern, supposing this is the input and this is the output and the observed data pattern is like this. Supposing this is the observed data pattern. Now, somebody tells me to fit a straight line on that. Okay. We can do this straight line fitting, but the straight line fitting will not be certainly an appropriate fitting. I mean, if I try to fit the straight line like this, okay, you can see that that particular straight line, how best you can think of, okay, will be having lots of deviations from the actual point. Okay. So, in that case we have to consider or we have to go in for some non-linear model. Okay. So, do not think that the linear model is able to solve everything, okay. but okay, for the time being we restrict ourselves to linear modeling at least in this lecture. So, now let us think that what is going to be, I mean because of this straight line fitting we are certainly going to make some error, is not it? There are number of points which are in error. So, how do we represent those error? Let us say that the error is represented as E okay. and uh, error for a particular point, let us say E p, I write E p will be equal to the target output for the point P. Like say for example, again in this curve, supposing I am interested in finding out the error that is happening at this point. Okay. Now, supposing this is point P is equal to 1, the first point I consider. Okay. Now, this one is having this as the actual output or what we can call as the target output. So, this is our T 1, the target output and this is the response that we have got after curve fitting. 
and after calf fitting means what? That is what the neural network is giving us because neural network is doing that calf fitting job essentially, is not it? So, this is the response okay, or rather in our case it will be y k okay, or the output. So, if I say that the response for the point p is y p. Now, okay, let us not use the subscripts, let us use the superscripts because the subscripts we were using for the neural network index. So, I think it will be uh, creating unnecessary confusion if I use the subscripts there. So, instead let me represent it as superscript. So, I say E p as the error pertaining to the point p. So, which will be now defined as the target output for the point p minus the actual observation, I mean the actual output which will be the fitted output. The fitted output will be here, this one. So, this will be our y p. So, this will be y p which will be the fitted output or the neural network response. Okay. And if I square it up, in that case I will be getting the error term or rather the squared error. Okay. And what I have to do is that in order to determine the total error for all this set of points that I have got, I have to define as summation of this E p and to be summed up over p. Okay. Means whatever points are there under this set of p, I have to include all of them which means to say that it will be summation of this T p minus y p whole square. Okay. This will be the summation of errors. All right. Now, why do we measure this error? Okay. Because this error measurement is very much necessary because if we start with any arbitrary intercept and slope for this straight line. Okay we should measure that error and then we will find out that in what direction we should adjust the slope and the intercept. So, that next time the fitting that I do can be a better fit. So, if I start with some initial assumption about the intercept and the slope okay, or to talk in terms of the neural network, if I start with some initial assumption of this w 1 and w 2. Okay. Then what I have to do is first measure that how much of error am I doing in the process and then dependent upon that error, okay, I have to adjust these w's or in terms of this I can say I have to reorient the straight lines intercept and the slope. So, that next time the fitting is better. Next time also I do the same measurement that with the better fitment I calculate the uh, errors, okay, the error over all the points p okay. and I this time come up with a new error measure. This new error measure may be less or better than the earlier error that we had got. Accordingly, we reorient the straight line. Say for example, supposing this is the initial, I mean, I mean this is the final straight line that we have fitted, okay. but supposing with the initial set of points, I place my guess to be like this that this is the initial slope. Now, I slowly I turn this so that after a few iterations, I get the straight line fitted as follows, okay, where the error becomes minimum. Because what happens is that if I try to orient this uh, straight line more, then again the error will be increasing is not it. So, we are orienting from here to there and then we are finding out that where the error becomes minimum. Okay. So, our objective in a neural network also to be to, to find out that where are we going to find that minimum error. If we now start making a plot of let us say in this case, in this uh, simple kind of neural network that we have considered out here, okay. take this model. All right. 
what we are doing? We have got x as the input and we have y as the output, right? And we are going to adjust which parameters W20 and W21 in order to determine the minimum error. So, what we can do is that over all these set of points, okay, we can calculate that how much of error, I mean how much of combined error measure that is E we obtain for different values of W21 and W20. And supposing we make a 3 D plot like this, 3 D plot where uh, let us say that on this axis I put say W 2 0, on this axis supposing I plot W 2 1 okay? and on this axis I plot the error. Okay? So, it is a 3 D plot now, can you imagine? It is becoming a 3 D plot, you vary W 2 0 in its entire range, you vary W 2 1 in its all possible range and there is one particular solution where this straight line is going to have the best fit and there the best fit means that where the error is going to be minimum. So, it will be ultimately a surface like this. Okay. It is a 3 D surface okay, that can be imagined to be like this. I mean if this is a surface then I mean you can, okay. you can imagine that this is a 3 D surface which will result out of all the possible values of W 2 zeros and W 2 1 and there will be one particular point where we are going to get the minimum E and that is the point which we want to reach. Is it followed? That is the point where we want to go. Now, okay, imagining a 3 D surface is little difficult. I mean we find it difficulty in visualizing a 3 D surface. So, let us visualize in a better way. Let us put a cutting plane and just try to observe the 2 D projection of that. Okay on that particular plane. Okay. In that case, our problem in a 2D could be modeled as follows, like if we have a curve of E, okay. supposing on this axis we are plotting E and let us say that instead of two variables here W20 and W21, we have got only a single variable. Okay, some variable which we have plotted in this direction. Now, we are going to reach the minimum point over here, but what could be our starting point? To start with in this example, in this case for example, we could start with any value of W 2 0 and W 2 1. Okay. We could be on this part of the surface, we could be on this part of the surface, we could be anywhere on the surface. Okay. But ultimately, we would like to reach this as our destination. If we could reach this destination, then I can say that the problem that I am going to solve with this kind of a neural network model is going to converge. If it does not, then really I have to doubt about the usage of this kind of neural network models at all. Okay. It has to reach this. So, what happens is that if this is our starting point, I mean on a 2 D error profile, if this is the starting point, okay, then just see what happens is that if you are considering this error curve, this error characteristic, error versus some parameter, supposing this is a parameter W that we take, okay, then if you are taking the partial derivative of this uh, E with W, okay, assuming that a very similar plot you also get for the other w's also. So, E is not dependent on this w alone. So, that is why it is a partial derivative that uh, we decided to take. Now, in this case what happens is that what is the slope of these uh, dou E dou w? Okay? The slope is like this, okay? it is in this direction, but 
if we are in this position, then on this curve with respect to this curve, we should slide down in this direction, is not it? We should make a slide down in this direction, so that by sliding down further, we ultimately come to this point. Okay. We may not be able to reach this point, this minimum point in one iteration, we may take several iterations in order to reach it, but ultimately we should reach it. Okay. Something you can imagine like this that you get a bowl okay, where you have just placed some small ball over here okay, and you have allowed that ball to roll down the surface of that bowl, where that ball will ultimately reach, the ball ultimately comes to the point of minima, is not it? Okay. <coughs> if we allow the ball to slide down freely, okay. if we do not allow it to slide down freely, if we try to forcibly make it, okay, things may be good, things may be bad. Okay. Like if the surface is having lot of friction, let us say, in that case the sliding process will be very slow, it will very slowly slide down. So, we may feel in, in the impatient about it and we may just put some taps, so that the ball slides down faster. But if we are, I mean too much uh, ambitious about its fall, that no, the fall should be much faster than that, then we are going to shake it so vigorously that it may ultimately leave the surface completely and just the ball will fly away. Okay, it can happen. So, we have to be careful about that, but the objective is that if you allow it to roll down freely, then it roll down okay, in the gradient descent, in a gradient descent way. If the ball lies here, it comes down this. If the ball lies in the opposite slope, that means to say here the slope is this is, is in this direction, but the ball has to roll down like this. So, it is always against the slope that it is sliding down. So, this technique is known as the steepest descent, okay. steepest descent approach. So, this will be something that we will discuss further okay, in the next class. Okay, any